the end of our last lesson, we identified acceleration as the slope or rate of change of the velocity curve. And we used this velocity curve that I have on the left as an example. Let's complete the corresponding acceleration graph. So again, we take the slope from the velocity curve to give us the height on the acceleration curve. The slope here, uh, it rises 40 miles in a single hour, so that's a 40 mile an hour slope for the first hour. And then the velocity is unchanged the second hour, so that means that our acceleration is zero. And for hours three and four, we gradually decline in velocity down to zero over the course of two hours, down from 40. So that's a acceleration of negative 20. Okay. Now let's just complete the picture. What are the acceleration units? Again, this is automatic. We just take whatever the vertical axis units are and we divide by the horizontal axis units. So acceleration's units are going to be miles per hour per hour. Now this is sometimes abbreviated as miles per hour squared, but that can be confusing to wrap your head around. So just think of it as a shorthand. What we're really saying is that the miles per hour itself is increasing or decreasing at a certain rate per hour. Now we can also continue the by analogy the work that we did before with signed area. Namely we can reconstruct the velocity versus time curve by looking at the signed area of the acceleration versus time curve. And so the signed area that I have here for the first hour is uh, 40 miles per hour per hour multiplied by one hour which gives me 40 miles and then no change here because the rectangular area here is zero and then I've got negative rectangular area here and that's going to be a total area of negative 20 times 2 that's going to be negative 40 but also an analogy with the original relationship between d versus t to r versus t and vice versa, there's the same problem. We don't have enough information in the acceleration curve to reconstruct the velocity curve. As we've argued before, this curve could have started at a different point, risen with the same slope, gone over, come down, and there'd be no way to distinguish the corresponding acceleration curves. They'd be identical. And so what is it that we need to definitively fix the velocity versus time curve? What we need is an initial, not position, but an initial velocity. Okay. We need to know what the initial velocity is. And in this case, of the curve, we'd say that the initial velocity v of zero would have been equal to zero, and in the case of the blue, we'd say that the initial velocity v of zero was 20. It allows us to determine which of the two curves. Let's just write that. Which of the two curves to construct. Also note that the units work as well, just for completeness sake. When we multiply miles per hour per hour times hours, we get velocity miles per hour. With what we've learned about acceleration, it's now time to update the initial diagram that we drew that connected d versus t and r versus t because now we can add on to it and connect to A versus T. So I'm going to redraw this diagram, but I'm going to make a couple of essential changes in addition to adding the new connection between R versus T and A versus T. Namely, I'm going to drop the 
visual notation of a graph d versus t and just use the more precise language that we came up with, namely x versus t. That in turn, when I look at the slope of the x versus t curve at a particular point, that gives me the height of the v versus t curve at that same point. Similarly, when I take the slope of the v versus t curve at a particular point, that gives me the height of the a versus t curve at that corresponding point, which in this case is that time. Now similarly, I can go from the a versus t curve to the v versus t curve by adding in the signed area. plus the initial, not the initial position, but in this case, the initial velocity. And finally, to complete the diagram, to go from velocity to position, I add in the signed area, plus the initial, in this case, position. Let's just remind ourselves of a couple of things again. One, when we go from left to right, we are saying that the slope at a given point represents the height of the next graph at that same point in time. When we're going right to left, we're saying that the signed area plus an initial condition at a given up to a given point represents the height at that given point. What this suggests as well is that we can start from an acceleration versus time curve given an initial velocity, reconstruct the velocity versus time curve, and then given an initial position from that we can in turn reconstruct the position versus time curve. And that's what we're going to do in an example in the next segment. But before we go on to that example, let me make a suggestion, and this is just advice, but I found it to be very useful for students that are really trying to prepare for calculus, and that is go find someone to teach this diagram to. Really the best way to cement your understanding of something is to find someone else to teach it to, and if you'll do that, then I think you'll be more confident about your recall and ability to use this diagram. So as I promised, what we have here is our first full-blown example. We're going to ask you to move from an acceleration versus time graph all the way over to calculating a final position. Now here's my advice. Pause the video and do this problem yourself. Then you can watch the video and see if your answer agrees with mine. Okay, let's see what you got. I start here and I look at the signed area because I'm trying to recreate the velocity versus time curve which is to the left of the acceleration versus time curve. My signed area is 10 times 2 hours, that gives me 20 and the units miles per hour squared multiplied by hours gives me miles per hour. So do I mark this point here? In fact, no I don't. Why is that? It's because I've got to use the initial condition. In this case, the velocity at time zero is 20. That means that my graph starts at 20 and ends after two hours at 20 more, namely 40. Let's connect that. Now I've got acceleration of negative 20 miles per hour squared and that continues for an hour. So this signed area is now negative 20 times 1, negative 20 miles per hour. And so my curve simply goes back down in the course of just one hour down to 20. So what did we have? We had an area here of 20 and an area here 
of negative 20. Now we have to calculate the area under this curve in order to construct what the position was at t equals 3 hours. Well, what do we have? We have a pair of trapezoids segmented right here. So let's find the area of this first trapezoid. This first trapezoid's area is one half the distance, or one half the average of the two parallel sides. I've got a side here that's 20, a side here that's 40, times the distance between them, 2. That gives me a signed area of, let's see, the 2's cancel, 20 plus 4, so this is 60. Okay. Here I have another trapezoid. Let's get this one. I'll pull that calculation out. It's going to be one half the average of the two heights, two parallel sides. Again, 40 plus 20. And the distance between the two parallel sides in this case is 1. So I have an area of 30. Okay. So again, x of 3 is not 90, not the 60 plus 30, but we add in the initial condition. Okay. I know I harp on that, but why do I do that? Because students, time and time again, in the heat of battle, forget to add in the initial position. And so finally, and this is hopefully the answer that you got, we get x of 3 is 100, namely, it was the initial position plus the two signed areas. So if you got that right, give yourself a pat on the back. If you got it wrong, don't beat yourself up, but make sure you understand how these simple calculations are done. Remembering, of course, that they could be much more complex. We could have a whole series of negative assigned areas, negative initial positions, and that can complicate the process. Let's recap what we've learned. The key has been the extension of our diagram to include acceleration as a function of time. And so, when we move left to right, the slope of the VT curve becomes the height of the A of T curve. The units of acceleration are always calculated by taking the units on the vertical axis and dividing them by the units on the horizontal axis. As a shortcut, we can describe that as miles per hour squared or it could be meters per second squared, what have you. Note that when we move from right to left, it's the signed area to the A of T curve that gives us the change in the V of T curve, but we don't have a V of T curve until we include the initial velocity. We can't just be placing the signed area as the height. We have to add the initial velocity. The complete diagram here has changed, of course, from the R versus T graph and the V versus T graph to a more formal notation where we're using the precise terminology X of T, V of T, and A of T. And notice that the initial conditions are different, of course. In the one case, we have an initial velocity, and in the second case, an initial position. Can't emphasize enough the importance of both doing and discussing sample problems. And so what I'd recommend is to find some unlikely victim and go teach these six bullet points to them. Maybe that's your mother, maybe it's your pet dog, but find someone to teach this to.